Welcome, everyone. Do you want to stand? We're going to pray in a moment. Just want to congratulate you all for running the marathon first thing this morning so you could get into church on time. Well done to all of you. <laughs> Record times, I'm sure. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we are running a great race this morning, brothers and sisters. We are. We're running the best race, running for Jesus. Hallelujah. Let, let, let's, let's bow our heads. Let's, let's just for a moment prepare our hearts for worship. You know, there's lots of things that can distract our minds and there's lots of things that can uh, steal our attention this morning. But we have to deliberately and purposefully come and, and set our hearts on Jesus this morning, set our minds on him, set our direction on him this morning. Lord God, Lord God, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, for your goodness to us, oh God. Lord, we're so privileged this morning, Lord. Oh, Lord, to have our sins forgiven, oh God. Oh, Lord, we are counted in, Lord, Lord, to the citizenship of heaven, oh God. Oh, Lord, that's where we belong. That's our home, oh God. Heaven is our home, Jesus, Lord. And Oh, Lord, we're, we're so thankful to you, oh God. Lord, that you have plucked us out, Lord. Lord, and set us, Lord, seated in heavenly places, Lord. Lord, we thank you this morning, Lord. And Lord, in these moments now, Lord, we want to exalt you, Lord. Lord, we want to worship you, oh God. Oh, Lord, we don't want to miss these moments, Lord. But, oh, Lord, come, Lord, and just, Lord, bless us, Lord, as we worship you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll clap your hands in our church. You have to help us at this now. Hallelujah. I once was fatherless. I once was fatherless. A stranger with no home. Your kindness wakened me. Wakened me. Your love is back. A call to come and die. By grace now. Sin has lost its death has lost its sting from the grave
the marvelous light. Just one more time, me too. I lift my hands and sing aloud.
confession Who else can lead us, lead us to freedom? No one, no one, no one And who else can heal all our sins and diseases? No one, no one, no one And who else can walk, walk on the water? No one, no one, no one And who else can answer, answer but fire?
distribute the emblems and just hold on to them we will partake together and be seated if you would like and um, so just Ephesians chapter 2 and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to this world and um, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we were by nature children of wrath just as the others but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness um, toward us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands that at the time you were without Christ 
being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile both of them to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Praise God. But God, where would we be if he didn't step in? He stepped down, way down into the gap of our sin. Jesus paid our price. There was only ever one person fit for heaven and that was Jesus. He was enough then and he is still enough now. As we come to the Lord's table, we remember and proclaim the Lord's death and his resurrection. So church, let's stand. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death as he come, till he comes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus, Lord, we glorify you, Lord. We thank you, God, Lord, that you stepped, Lord, into that gap of separation, Jesus, Lord. You have tore the veil, Jesus, Lord. We have direct access to you, Lord. We have been brought near by your blood, Jesus, Lord. And we remember and we proclaim your death and your resurrection. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus our Lord. The veil is torn. Praise God. In Jesus' name. Amen.
destined to die, poured out for you, all mankind. God's only son. God's only son. Perfect in spotless world. He never sinned, suffered as one as if he did. Oh, let's declare with a great shout all authority. All that Thank you, God. Lord, you stepped into our world, oh God. Lord, and you overcame, Lord, sin. You overcame, Lord, death. Oh, Father, Lord, on our behalf, Jesus. Oh, Lord, and you have all authority. You overcame, and you give that, that, that overcoming to us, Jesus. Thank you, oh God. Oh, Lord, we have Oh, Lord, been lifted, oh, Lord, out of our sin, oh, God. Lord, because of your overcoming, oh, God. Lord, we've been lifted, oh, Lord, out of our, our condemnation, out of our guilt, out of our filth, out of our darkness. Lord, because you overcame, Jesus. You overcame, Jesus. You overcame, oh, God. Oh, Lord, and we today, oh, Lord, stand in the privilege of that, Lord. Lord, we stand in the victory that you have won, Jesus. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the thanks, all the praise this morning. Thank you, oh, God, for that cross, oh, God, Lord, where you went, Lord, and suffered, Lord, that we could go free this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. Before you sit down this morning, shake somebody's hand. Welcome somebody. Welcome to all our online brothers and sisters. Lovely to have you with us this morning. Praise God. Good to be together this morning. And well done to all of you for pushing through whatever obstacles you faced this morning to get here. Well, I, I had to uh, get permission from my guardy to get through into, into the city this morning. I don't know what you faced, but I'm here. I'm here and I'm worshiping the Lord and I'm enjoying the Lord and it's good to be with you all. 
this morning. Hallelujah. So um, you've, you've shaken hands. Is there anybody here for the first time? Any, any newcomers? You're here for the first time. Yeah, you're welcome. Somebody down here on the, on the middle right. You're very welcome. Anybody else here for the first time? Any guests amongst us this morning? Yes, you're welcome. Down our left. You're very welcome. Anybody else? Give me a big wave. Somebody in the middle here. You're very welcome. Lovely to have you with us. A couple of people here in the middle. Anybody else? Get, oh, there's somebody down the left hand, left hand middle there. Uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, those of you that are here for the first time or guests, would you stand and allow us to really welcome you this morning? Please, just stand. Don't be shy. It's only us. There's only a few of us here. Stand up. Yeah, you are very welcome. Very welcome. Lovely to have you with us. You're so welcome. Yeah. We have a little card that the ushers will give you. It's a Connect card. If you want to find out more information about the church, you can fill that out, and, and we'll keep in contact with you. And also, we have a Connect table downstairs uh, that you can go to after service and uh, find out more information about whatever you're interested in here in the church. But you're very welcome this morning. Don't feel you have to rush away after service with tea and coffee, uh, bits and pieces to eat, but mostly a good welcome, a good handshake, and, and, and some friends to make here this morning. So you're very, very welcome. All our Cork Church regulars, give yourself a big clap this morning. Come on. You deserve it. <laughs> Praise God. Well, what I'm going to do right now is ask our ushers to serve the envelopes and pens, and if you need an envelope or pen for uh, cash given this morning, please just raise your hands. The ushers will look after you with that. We also have a card machine out in the red carpet area. If during the when we take up the offering later on, if you want to use that, you're welcome to go out there and make use of that. Praise God. So what we're going to do right now is dismiss our primary school aged children from junior infants to fifth class. Kids, may the Lord bless you this morning from junior infants to fifth class, not the preschoolers. Parents of preschoolers, please keep your children with you and we'll dismiss them later on. May the Lord, can we give our children a clap as they go this morning? <laughs> Praise God. And we're going to ask the studio if you could run the announcements video for us. Thank you. Hey, welcome to Quark Church. We have two services for the whole church every week on a Wednesday evening at 7.15 p.m. and Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We have a Portuguese speaking service every Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. Bring along your kids too because we have Kids Church running alongside. On Fridays we have our youth group for young people that are in 6th class to 6th year. Youth starts at 7 p.m. and finishes at 9.30. Sunday nights we have a service for our young adults at 6.30 p.m. Our church prayer meeting happens every Monday online at 7 p.m. via Zoom, on Thursday at 12.30 online and in the sanctuary, and Sunday in the cafe at 10 a.m. As a church, we run free Quark Food Bank that opens between 10.30 and 12.30 on a Wednesday and Thursday. If you would like to book an appointment, then please send a message to the free Quark number, which you can find in the foyer of the church. Our office is open from Tuesday to Friday, 10 to 4. And if you need pastoral care, we are here to help, so please feel free to make an appointment. That's all from me. Have a good day. Praise God. Just one extra special announcement is that the 18th uh, of June, we're going to have our baptismal service out in Farron Woods. So it's going to be a church picnic. It's going to be a lovely, lovely time. So please put it in your diaries, prepare for after service that Sunday to, to drive out to Farron Woods and we'll just have, have a lovely time of, of food and fellowship. And th there's about 20 people plus um, getting baptized on that Sunday. So it's going to be going to be a great day. I don't know about you, but there's something about baptisms that just does my heart good. You know, I just always rejoice to see people. It brings real joy to my heart, real joy to my heart. So we're going to be celebrating that Sunday. That's the 18th of June. Put that in your, in your diaries. So praise God. Let's uh, pray over this morning's offering. Brothers and sisters, Lord God, I thank you, O oh God, that 
Lord, you have met us, oh God. Lord, Lord, stepped into our lives, oh God. And Lord, we could never, ever, Lord, repay you for that, oh God. And but Lord, we can worship you, Jesus. And you desire our worship, oh God. And Lord, well, thank you, Lord, for these moments this morning, oh God, of, of worship, Lord. And Lord, we, we continue to worship, Lord, as we bring our offering to you this morning, oh God. And Lord, our desire, Lord, is that you would, Lord, take our giving this morning, Lord. Would you bless many people, oh God. Lord, Lord, thank you, Lord, for Feed Cork, oh God, all that's happening through that, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for our missions teams going out, oh God. Oh Lord, thank you, God, for the, the conferences and events, Lord, that, that, that are happening, Lord, because of the giving of your people, oh God. And Lord, so we give, Lord, with glad hearts, Lord, with worship and hearts this morning, oh God. Oh, Lord, please, Lord, take the, this offering, Lord, and, and bless many people through it. In your name, Jesus. Amen. In a moment, Andy's going to bring our offertory song, but uh, now we're going to dismiss the preschoolers. So preschoolers, you can go down to your class this morning, Then Pastor Patrick's going to bring the word. Praise God, Brother Andy. Just one short announcement, just for our men. Next week, Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m., the men are going for a walk uh, just along the marina. I'm told not to make the walk too far. The walk is not going to be too far. Um, but uh, we, we might be walking for roughly around about an hour long. Uh, if we, we, we're all going to meet outside the church. We, we go for a walk down to the marina. We'll come back and we'll eat something here. So all men are invited. Bless the Lord. The song is called The King is Coming. The market place is empty there's no more traffic in the streets all the builders tools are silent there's no more time to harvest wheat busy housewives cease their labors and in the cold room no debate Work on earth is all suspended As the king comes through the gate Oh, the king is coming The king is coming I have heard the trumpet sound And now his face I see Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. Happy faces line the hallways, those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged, hand in hand, stand all aglow. Who once were crippled, broken, ruined, now clad in garments white as snow. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. I have heard the trumpet sound, and now His face I see. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. God is coming for me. I can hear the chariots rumble. I can see the marching throng. The flurry of God's trumpet now spells the end of sin and wrong. Robes are now enfolded. Heaven's past stand all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled. They start to sing amazing praise. Oh, the King 
escame daqui is coming I have heard the trumpet sound and now his face I see oh the king is coming the king is coming praise God is coming for me can we see that last verse again I can hear the trumpet sound I can hear the chariots rumble I can see the marching throng I can see the marching throng the flurry of God's trumpet now spells the end of sin and wrong regal robes are now enfolded heaven's grand stand on in place heaven's choir is now assembled they start to sing amazing grace holy king is coming the king is coming i have heard the trumpet sound and now his face i see oh the king is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. King is coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray. Lift your hands with me in faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. What a proclamation. What a truth. What a reality. You are already here living in us through your spirit. But there is a day when you will come and wrap this whole thing up and usher in a kingdom that will have no end. Lord, one day, the kingdom that is in us will cover the whole earth, Lord. And so we usher that day and we say, Maranatha, Lord, come soon. We love you. We bless you. We thank you for your presence. We delight in the fact that we are your people, called by your name, redeemed by your blood. And today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that we would hear from you. Lord, that your spirit would touch our hearts. Lord, that your word would find a place in our hearts, oh God. Lord, that there would be comfort in Zion for the people of God. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Lord, use me. I am just a man. Lord, I'm but dust and ash. And I need your grace. I need your power. I need your anointing. Let the people see you, Lord, and see through me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, church. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you again. And I want to share a word with you. I want to talk on the subject this morning of resting in God's hand of providence. Resting in the providence of God. Amen. And to do it, I'm going to look at two situations, two occasions from the life of David that actually happened in his absence. They happened when he wasn't there. Uh, but God, God's providence was there in, the, in those moments. There was a grace on David's life that operated in instances where he wasn't even there. Providence kicked in. Amen. Providence was in the room, even though David wasn't. And it was all to bring about the will of God for David, uh, uh, for will of God in David's life. Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you today about providence. I don't define providence this way. The providence of God is his constant care for and his absolute rule over all creation for his own glory and the good of his people. Amen? That's what providence is. That's a quote by a guy called Jerry Bridges. 
Uh, but le- and we know Romans 8, 28, let me read it for you. It says this, it says that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. That's providence. But let me give you an example. This morning, uh, I drove in. Uh, I didn't get any coffee on my way in, right? So I was actually pretty early this morning. I was up for about five o'clock. I got no coffee and I'm driving in and I knew I'd be speaking this morning and I knew I needed my caffeine hits. So as soon as I walk toward the door of the church, Pastor Stephen is walking out of the church and he is literally mid-sentence saying, so is there anyone who would like coffee? He's on his way out of the church to buy coffee. I'm on my way in needing coffee. God's providence was at work. Hallelujah. Literally, the first thing out of my mouth was, I'll take a coffee. See, God knew I needed it, and God blessed Pastor Stephen richly with, with wealth and <laughs> so, so he'd have the money to buy it for me. So God providentially made Pastor Stephen rich enough to buy me coffee. And so I walk in the door and providence was at work. Hallelujah. A providential hand. I didn't see it. I couldn't understand it. Listen to this quote here by Philip Doddridge. While providence supports, let saints securely dwell. The hand which bears all nature up shall guide his children well. Hallelujah. There is a divine hand at work in your life. There is a divine hand of providence at work in your life. Uh, B.B. Warfield said this, a firm faith in the universal providence of God is the solution to all earthly troubles. Amen. Faith in the providence of God is the solution to our anxieties, to our fears, to our regrets, to our resentments, to our bitternesses, understanding that there's a divine hand in every situation is the very thing that can free us this morning from so many of our anxieties, fears, regrets over situations we encounter. Folks, God is calling us to rest in his providence. Amen? He's calling us to rest in it, to trust him. Some of us this morning can't understand how doors will open in your life. Can't understand how the door is going to open, how God is going to make it happen, how God is going to create an opportunity, how how you're going to get there. And there are others here this morning who can't understand why a door is closed. Can't understand why the door is closed. Can't see why a situation ended the way that it ended. Well, I want to tell you this morning There is a hand that keeps things for you and a hand that keeps things from you. Hallelujah. A hand that keeps things for you and a hand that keeps things from you. And my prayer today is this, that God would set some people free from looking forward in fear, wondering how things are going to happen and set some people free from looking back in regrets on how things have happened. Amen. That's what I'm praying for. And the way I I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to do this is we're going to tackle two questions this morning, two questions, and then we're going to look at a principle that I think will help us to understand providence and to move out of some of the confusion that can plague us in life when doors don't open in the way that we think they should or when they close abruptly. Amen. Amen. So turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16 for the first of the two instances we're going to look at this morning. Just some context. In the previous chapter, Samuel, the great prophet, perhaps one of the greatest prophets Israel had known, just had the grievous experience of having to depose King Saul. Saul had failed. Saul had not heeded the word of the Lord. The scriptures say he did not listen to the word of the Lord. Rather, he listened to the opinions of the people that God called him to lead. And instead of fully wiping out the Amalekites, he saved the 
King, King Agag, and save some of the riches and save some of the cattle. He didn't do what God called him to do. And God sent Samuel with an awful message. Saul, had you have continued on the way you should have, the kingdom would have remained with you. But the Lord is taking it from you and giving it to another, one who will do all that my heart desires. And so Saul lost the kingdom that day. And in 1 Samuel 16, God sends Samuel to find another king, to find a new king. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm actually going to read most of the chapter. Bear with me. Let's go. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the, uh, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse 6, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his height, or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Hallelujah. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass by Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there, are, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes. Hallelujah. And when they sent, they brought him in, and he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went up to Ramah. You know, another thing that's important to understand when we look at this passage, uh, you would have to go to Psalm 51 verse 5. David says, in iniquity did my mother conceive me. A lot of commentators actually believe that David was an illegitimate child. And for that reason, because of his illegitimacy, he wasn't invited to the ceremony. But it is, isn't it amazing that although he was kept aside, it became his own coronation. The very party he wasn't invited to became his coronation. It's amazing. But let me break it down because I want to speak to you today. If you're surrounded by people who don't see anything in you, do you feel sidelined this morning? Do you feel passed over? If you do, don't fear. Hallelujah. And there's some of you, I know you are facing insurmountable odds. There are things keeping you out of the room. Maybe it's language. Maybe it's education. Maybe it's background. Maybe it's the opinions of people. And you can't see this morning how you will be granted an opportunity. For some of you, you're seeking a position. Others, you're seeking a, a job opportunity. Some of you, you're seeking a home. And some of you are discouraged this morning because you are uh, in the, you're looking in the face of more qualified, gifted people. Well, I want to tell you this morning, God wants to deliver you from the pressure of having to make something happen. Amen. God wants to deliver you from that. The pressure of trying to form your own future. Because there is a rest in the gospel. There is a rest in the call of God that frees us and gives us the confidence concerning our futures. Glory to God. You don't have to compete for the future God has for you. 
That is amazing this morning. Can I get an amen this morning? If it's for you, it's for you. And I'm going to show you from the text. If it's for you, it's for you. He will give it to you. Hallelujah. He will bring it about in your life. You don't have to be in the room. You don't have to be in the room. You don't have to fight for your future. I remember uh, when I first moved home from college to Bandon, my mother came in and told me that there was a youth cafe opening called the Funky Fish, right? And she said, I should go with my siblings down to the Funky Fish to see what, you know, what was going on there and just have a look at it. And my words, I'll never forget them, were I wouldn't be caught dead down there. So I'm not quite the, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't the pleasant man you see before you this morning 15 years ago. <laughs> so that, that, those words came out of my mouth. I think it was six months later, I got a phone call out of the blue from some ministers who told me that they'd, been, they'd gotten a phone call from the people at the Funky Fish. They were looking for somebody to go down there and for, for a wage, liaise with young people and just share the gospel with them. What an opportunity. I was being paid more then than a lot of pastors are paid now to run their churches. God gave me an opportunity, offered something to me. I didn't even have the attitude. I didn't even have the predisposition, but God had a plan. You know, David was probably illegitimate. He wasn't invited to the ceremony, but the scriptures say God saw a king in him. Hallelujah. God saw a king in him. And let me tell you this morning, God sees your calling. It says in the text that he sought or found for himself a king. What it really means is God looked on David and considered him a king. So Jesse saw him as illegitimate, but God saw him as a king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God saw David in the pasture, faithfully doing what he was called to do. A man not even invited to a family reunion, to a family get together, not seen as worthy to be on the guest list. And God saw a king in him. You ever been not invited to something? You ever been excluded that way? God sees your calling this morning. He considers you a king, regardless of the opinions of those around you. Hallelujah. He was the true king of Israel. The Lord was the true king of Israel. The people wanted a king. God allowed it happen, but God was still orchestrating events. He was the king they didn't want, but he was still the king with all authority. And he is the one in control this morning. It doesn't matter what people think of you. Hallelujah. God saw a king in David. You, like David, are God's only choice for whatever role he has in mind for you. Isn't that wonderful this morning? Isn't it wonderful? And David's background and the opinions of others, namely his own father, seem to close the door of opportunity for David. How many of us are discouraged this morning because the opinions of other people seem to have excluded us or kept us out of an opportunity that maybe God wants for us? Background, illegitimate, the opinions of others, those close to him. And how about this? David had seven brothers more suited for the job. Oh, can you imagine it? Samuel's in the room and Jesse starts bringing out his sons. It must have been like Cheltenham. They must have, they must have, come, you know, they must have come in like that, you know? Everyone taller and more handsome than the last. Handsome, able, gifted, talented, all of that. And yet God was in the room speaking to Samuel. Samuel, don't look at the external. Samuel, don't look at the natural. Samuel, I don't look at people the way that you do. I don't judge people the way that you do. I'm not a man. I don't look at people that way. I don't care what their opinions are of David. I found a king in him. And these, these boys come out and God's like, nope. And the next one comes out even more handsome. God's like, nope. Shama comes out, Jim Bobby. Big education, tertiary degree, well-dressed, all of that. God's like, not him either. Samuel's wondering what's going on. 
he has to turn around to Jesse and say, Jesse, do you have any other sons I should know about? Is there, do, do you have like a Harry Potter living under the stairs that I need to know about? Are there any other sons here? Because I'm running out of options. And there are those who, are more, who may be better suited in the natural than you. Well, God doesn't judge the way men do. He will not allow how others perceive you to be a barrier. Come on now, church. Come on now, church. He won't allow it happen. Oh, he won't. They might be more qualified, more educated. They may have more degrees, more gifts, more talents. They might be taller. Come on, short kings. They might be better looking. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because God is still in control. Because God is king. Hallelujah. Jesus is king. Jesus is still in control. God's, verse 7, God said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. I don't look at things the way you do. People look on the outside, but I look at the heart. Listen to me this morning. It's the stature of your heart, not your height. Hallelujah. It's what's going on in here. Hallelujah this morning. And look at verse 11. This, listen, if we don't get up and do a victory lap around the church, when you look at verse 11, I don't know, I'm going to do it on my own. Look at what he says. He says, so he asked Jesse, are, all, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, and he's tending sheep. Samuel said, send to him. We're not going to sit down until he arrives. If it's for you, he'll hold it for you. If it's for you, if it's for you, if it's for you, he'll hold it for you. Seven more able, more suited, better, better qualified people than you. You just wait over there. The man I've chosen is on his way. What rooms, what doors are providence opening for you this morning? You're looking for a job. You're looking for an opportunity. You're looking for a place to live. You're looking, looking, looking behind a door, but in a room you're not in yet. Providence is at work. What doors are going to open? Hallelujah. We don't need to kick them down. There's someone on the other side. There's a God on the other side opening them for you because he chose you. We're not going to sit till he arrives. I'll hold it for you. I'll keep it for you. Just be busy doing what I called you to do. And they all had to stand and wait. Folks, what does all of this mean this morning? It means be yourself. You can be yourself. Hallelujah. How much time do we spend trying to make sure the right people like us? God opens doors, not men. Hallelujah. God will elevate the authentic you, not the you you're trying to present to the people whose favor you think you need in order to be elevated. Thank you, Jesus. God was in the room contending for the David he saw, not the David unworthy to be invited by his father. That means you can be you. Let them have their opinions. Hallelujah. What has God provided for himself in you? What has he provided for himself in you? What does he see in you? What room will he put you in? He's anointed you. He'll appoint you. Hallelujah. So be yourself and don't empower people. You don't need to. God has the final say. It's not about how they see you. So stop trying to change how they see you. He sees a king this morning. Hallelujah. It can be ministry, a job, an opportunity. It doesn't matter what they think or how many people they would prefer over you or how much better than you those people might be. The best candidate is always the one who needs the most grace for the job. Hallelujah this morning. And at the right time, the very people who didn't see anything in you will have to stand and watch as you're anointed and positioned. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's true. They'll have to watch. Keep a, keep a note. Keep, their, keep a note because they'll have to watch. Isn't it amazing? It's a quote by a, a commentator called Alan Redpath. So small was David in his father's esteem that it wasn't considered necessary to include him in the family when the prophet of God called them to sacrifice. 
You may not be intellectual or well thought of in your family circle. You may be despised by others for your faith in Christ. Perhaps you had only a little share in the love of your parents as David did. But remember that those who are rejected by men often become the beloved of the Lord. Those whom men put last, God often puts first. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, it's amazing, folks. It reminds me of Tom Brady. It reminds me of Tom Brady. Picked 199th. 100 out of 200. Out of 200. And Tom Brady went on to be the greatest quarterback of all time. Seven Super Bowl rings. The last pick became the greatest of all time. It's amazing. I think Belichick drafted him. He must have seen something in him. He must have seen something in him. Isn't it amazing? If you're in last place, if you feel like you're in last place this morning, hallelujah, he sees something in you and he knows how to elevate you. And so David went back to his father's sheep. He went back to his father's sheep. He was at rest. Hallelujah. He was chosen. He was anointed. David went right back to the pasture because there is time between anointing and appointing. Amen? Yeah, there is time, okay? He could rest in the in-between. Why? Because he didn't have to break down the door. Providence opened it from the inside and greeted him as a friend. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's already in the room. Say it with me this morning. He's already in the room. He's already in the room. I want to look tonight at another instance in the life of David. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 29. And I want to answer another question. So we've looked at the question, Lord, how will this door open for me? Well, I also want to look this morning at the question of, Lord, why did that door close? Why did that door close? Why did it close? Because there is a hand that keeps things for you, but there's also a hand that keeps things from you. Amen. It's all in the providence of God. And some of us this morning are banging on closed doors. Banging on closed doors. In mourning this morning, and maybe it's relationships or situations that have ended, and there are some of us who feel wounded and rejected because of doors that have closed on us. I'd like to look again in the life of David at 1 Samuel, this time chapter 29, I'm going to look at an amazing instance. Again, the providential hand of God working in the life of David. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 29. How many of you know sometimes rejection is really redirection? How many of you know that this morning? Sometimes it's redirection. David had feared for his life, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 27, that one day Saul would succeed, find him and kill him. He'd been running so long from the mad king that he actually left the borders of Israel and went to a king called Achish, a Philistine king in Gath. And there he spent a year and four months. Have you ever spent a year or longer in the wrong sort of relationship? That's exactly what happened to David. And the Bible says here in verse 29, uh, 1 Samuel 29, Now the Philistines had gathered at their forces in Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. As the lords of the Philistines were passing by on hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on the rear with Achish, the commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? See, they're marching out against Israel. And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who had been with me now for days and years since he deserted me? I found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back, that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us into battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men who are here? Is not this David, of whom they sang to one another in dances, 
Saul has struck down his thousands, and David is tens of thousands. He couldn't get away from the testimony of God in his life. It's amazing. Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been honest, and to me it seems right that you should march out and in with me in the campaign, for I have found nothing wrong with you from this day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you. So go back now and go peaceably that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, but what have I done? David, shh, be quiet. <laughs> what have I done? And have you found in your servant from this day? What have you found in your servant from this day? I entered your service until now that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king. And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us into battle. Now then arise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who came with you and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So David set out with his men in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, but the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Folks, let me say to you this morning, some relationships, some situations have to end. They have to end. And the reason is because they're not a part of the call. They're not a part of the call of God that is on your life. Because God will not allow you settle for anything that is less than his purpose for your life. David had been anointed and called to be the king of Israel. But in his discouragement and in his despair, he cast off his call and ran beyond the borders of the kingdom and ended up in a relationship that was not God's best for him. Ended up in a situation through discouragement that wasn't God's best for him. Ended up in a place where he did things that were far from the heart of God. And yet the call of God in the, the providence of God, the hand of providence, followed him beyond the borders even of the kingdom. David couldn't run from his own goal. Even after a year and four months as a Philistine king's hitman, the call was still on his life. Folks, listen to, listen to me. The relationship, the situation that you may be mourning this morning, the thing that ended, the door that closed, the situation that stopped. So for some of you, it's a relationship. For others, it's a job. For others, it's something that you loved, that, you, that was, was a comfort and a, 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 a refuge for you for a season. Well, it's over and it ended. God did it. God did it. God did it. David couldn't outrun his calling, folks, this morning. Let me say that to you. Even in failure, for those of you who are unable to move on from that relationship, I want you to know that God doesn't want you to worry about the people he removed from your life. God removed them from your life. That's what I'm saying this morning. Because he heard conversations that you didn't. He saw things you couldn't. And he made the move that you wouldn't. For some of you, unless it got uncomfortable and the door closed, you never would have left. But the providence of God was at work to keep things from you that would derail you from your calling and keep you from the ultimate thing that God called for you, a purpose for you in your life. Folks, this morning, some of you need to know, God would say, I ended it. I was behind that rejection to put you back on course. You would have settled you would have accepted less than I had planned to give you. And they're out of your life because they didn't factor into your call. He heard what you didn't, saw what you couldn't, and made the separation that you wouldn't. This morning, let me encourage you. God did not inflict on you the pain of going. He saved you from the pain of staying. He saved you from the pain of staying. His no is not a rejection, it's a redirection. 
Can we say amen this morning? In every setback, in all the setbacks of your life as a believer, God is plotting for your joy. God wouldn't let David live out his life that way. Are we ready this morning to thank God for the doors he closed as well as the ones he opened? Amen. Amen. I closed the door. I shut that door. You couldn't shut it, so I shut it. You wouldn't have stopped it, so I stopped it. You would have left that door open. You would have accepted something less than what I had for you, so I closed it. God rules and he overrules. Hallelujah this morning. Sometimes the love of God, the providence of God is to close a door that you wouldn't close, that you wouldn't open, that you wouldn't close. Lord, help us learn to thank you for every no. Help us to see the mercy in the doors you close. Behind the door you close is a greater pain than the pain of separation, than the pain of disappointment, than the pain that you're feeling now because it ended the way that it ended. Lord, thank you for protecting me from what I thought I wanted. Can we begin to talk that way to the Lord this morning? Thank you for protecting me from what I thought I wanted, from what I thought would bring me joy and happiness and fulfillment. You, in your mercy, closed the door. Thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you for the mercy of providence, the hand that keeps things from us, that closes the doors we would have left open. Amen this morning. Amen this morning. Hallelujah. You know, there's a story. George Whitfield, the great preacher, was employed by his brother in the Bell Inn, in an inn, but he couldn't get along with his brother's wife. <laughs> so he gave up his job and went to Bristol. He couldn't get along with his sister-in-law, so he quit his job and he went to Bristol. Then step by step, he went to Oxford and met with John and Charles Wesley. Amazing. And there he developed a ministry that touched countless thousands of lives on both sides of the Atlantic. Whitfield was probably known as the greatest preacher of his time, all because of a closed door, all because of a relationship that ended, all because of something that didn't work out. Can I encourage you this morning to begin to rejoice in closed doors? Lastly, this morning, I want to talk to you about a principle. We've answered two questions. Now I want to talk about a principle to you. How do we under, understand this providence? How do we, in the confusion of doors that close on us and doors that maybe we're waiting to open, how do we understand this providence? Well, here A.J. Gordon says, God's providence is like the Hebrew Bible. We must begin at the end and read backward in order to understand it. So in other words, we trust forwards and we understand backwards. We trust forwards and we interpret backwards. You can only see his hand in reverse. Amen? You've heard the saying, hindsight is 2020. Well, folks, spiritual hindsight is 2020. We trust forwards, but we interpret backwards. How many of us are in confusion today because we're trying to understand forwards instead of trust? We're trying to understand now, discern a hand that, that works in the unseen, but we can see everything that the hand does in hindsight. Folks, to me, none of this, no story bears this out more than the life of Joseph. A man who knew trauma, a man who knew rejection, a man who was rejected by his family, wrongly accused, thrown in prison. To me, the most painful part of his story was 11 years into a sentence where a cup bearer and a, 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 cup, a baker and a, and a wine bearer or a cup bearer promised to put a word in to Pharaoh for him and then forget. Can you imagine what that must have been like for this man, falsely imprisoned? He understood trauma. He understood pain. He understood it. 
But at the right time, God exalted him, took him from the prison to the palace, took him from in a night, God did it. At a night, providence opened a door for Joseph and he was established. And then his own brothers who had thrown him away, who'd cast him off into slavery. Do you see the symmetry? Do you see it happening in the life of David and happening in the life of Joseph and ultimately happening in the life of Christ? But look at what he says in Genesis 45. Now the prime minister of Egypt, looking at his brothers who can't recognize him, he consoles them. And look at what he says in 45, 5 through 8. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, 2020, folks. 2020. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But look at verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. He made me the father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. It wasn't you who did it to me, it was God. It's only in hindsight, it's only in hindsight you see it. Listen to me. It's a quote from a, actually a movie I saw recently. There are the hands that made us. And, therefore, and there are the hands that guide the hands. There are the hands that make us. And there are the hands that guide the hands. This morning, can you be encouraged? There are the hands that inflict trauma and pain and harm and rejection and heartbreak. And then there are the hands that guide the hands. Hallelujah this morning. Behind the hand of trauma is a hand of providence. All things work together for the good in the lives of those who are loved of God and called according to his purpose. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. There are the hands that made us and there are the hands behind the hands. Even the cross can only be understood backwards. Even the cross can only be understood that way. Acts chapter 4 verse 27. Indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Look at the Amplified Bible. The next verse says, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined before the creation of the world to occur. So without knowing it, they served your purposes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God turned that horrible scaffold upon which men murdered their maker into a stage upon which he demonstrated the wonder of his saving grace. God converted that gallows into a means of grace so that the cross, so that the cross that meant a horrible death to Jesus now means everlasting life to us. It's not the hands, but the hands that guide the hands. Even the cross folks this morning, looking forward, seeing only the plots of Herod and the Jews and the Romans, but behind those plots, was the hand of God. There is a hand in your life that will keep things for you and keep things from you. It is the hand that put the very Son of God on a cross to buy a way back for you, to purchase a salvation for you, that you would have a name and more than a name, a purpose in this life. Am I the only one? Who can rejoice this morning? I don't, I can rest. You can rest, rest, beloved. Rest in the face of your future. He's behind that door. Rest, rest. That door closed because he closed it. 
you can only see his hand in reverse. There's a poem called The Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours. He weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent, and the shuttles cease to fly, will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reasons why. The dark threads are as a needle, or as needful, in the weaver's skillful hand, as the threads of gold and silver, and the pattern that he's planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Folks, in conclusion, why don't you stand with me this morning? In conclusion, there is a day when it will all make sense. There is a day when it will all make sense where we will rejoice over every no, where we will see not just the hands that God opened, the doors that God opened, but the doors that he closed and the reasons why. There is a day when you and I will understand the no's and the mercy, what he kept us from. There is a grace behind every closed door. And this morning, very simply, I believe we're called to do something we're called to trust him in the everyday. I will not try and understand as I move forward. Instead, I'll trust in the day when I will see the weaver's hand and understand all that he did, the reasons behind every disappointment, the grace behind the rejection, the grace behind the no. There'll be a day when I see it all, but that day may not be today. So today, we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, we submit to him. We trust whether the threads are black or gold or silver, knowing one day God is going to turn around that portrait, that painting, that tapestry, and show us that picture of Christ that he's painted across the canvas of our lives. Today, let me encourage you, church. You can rest in God's providence. You can rest in his work, rest in his grace. Lift your hands with me this morning. We just want to thank him as I hand over to Pastor Stephen. We just want to thank him. Lord, thank you. Thank you. There will be a day of understanding. There will be a day where I can see it all. Like, like, like Israel, I'll lean on my staff and worship seeing the full plan of God and what you did, Lord, through the pain that I experienced. But until that day, grace me to trust you. There is not a room you have called me to that I will not stand in. And there's not a door that you closed that you didn't close for a reason. Thank you this morning for your grace. Thank you this morning for your providence. Thank you, Lord. God, Lord, bring us into rest, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in His hand. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I 
more. I have a father. I have a father. He calls me his own. He'll never leave. He'll never leave me. Hallelujah. No matter where you find me, He knows. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He knows my every thought. He sees. Each tear that falls and hears me when. Just can we sing it with confidence? He knows, He knows my name. Hallelujah. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear. And is me ah. Hallelujah. 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 What an encouraging word this morning, brothers and sisters. God took Joseph, brought him through a prison, and made him a president. But then God took the Apostle Paul from being a, a Pharisee and he ended up in prison but both was on to the glory of God and both benefited others many others we benefit from the scriptures that the Apostle Paul wrote but both lives were under the hand of God and your life today your life this week is known by God, is under the hand of God, and you are loved by Him. It's all in the context of love. He loves us. So we need to settle the argument. Maybe you're arguing, arguing with God, because that's who the argument is with at the end of the day. The argument is with God. I don't like this. I don't like this, God. We need to settle it and trust Him. Trust Him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, you see, Lord, our struggle and our fight, Lord, with some of the things you've allowed happen in our lives, and some of the things you're bringing us into, oh God. But Lord, today, Lord, we don't want to fight with you, Jesus. Lord, we want to say, Lord, that we know you love us, Jesus. We know you love us, oh God. And we trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you. You died on that cross, Lord, proving that you love us, oh God. You made the first sacrifice, Jesus. And you made the greatest sacrifice, oh God. And so we trust you, Jesus. Lord, help us, Lord, whether, Lord, the struggle is with health, finances, housing, education, it doesn't matter, Lord, relationships, we trust you, Jesus. We trust you. We decided, Lord, Lord, by faith, Lord, based on your character, oh God, based on who you are, Jesus, we trust you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And we love you this morning, oh God. And we honor you and we worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You know, brothers and sisters, having a word like that allows us to go in peace, a deep peace. And we can walk in faith during this week and the storms may blow and, and the sun may shine. Hopefully it'll shine this week. But we can go in peace and rest. God is with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we thank the Lord one more time before we leave this morning? Thank you, Lord.
thank you, Pastor Patrick, for just bringing such a, a wonderful, wonderful word this morning. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. Have a great week. Enjoy a cup of coffee, some fellowship, some love downstairs before you leave. God bless you.